Good morning to you. British shoppers unexpectedly cutting back on their spending in January. This as retail prices rose close to 2% in the month compared to a year ago. Is this, Mark, the strongest sign we've got to date that the country's economy is heading for some sort of a post-Brexit slowdown? Yeah, good morning, Dean. I think that's certainly the case. I um, mean, the data that we've seen out of the UK has been consistently a lot better than people have expected across the board. So this is, uh, you know, quite unusual. I think the December uh, retail sales figures as well in the UK were also weak as well. So I think it does kind of bodes well for you know the people that have been following Mark Carney and the Bank of England's warnings about Brexit and what that actually means. It's you know it's, it takes time for it to feed through. If you think you know the vote happened in June last year, we're kind of just now potentially starting to see signs of some weakness. And we uh, hear from Carney this week, don't we? That's right. Yeah. So I, I think you'll probably get a bit more colour in terms of you know his thoughts and the Bank of England's positioning. But I think you know if the data continues, it's certainly going to make them feel a lot more dovish and a, um, a lot more likely to keep interest rates lower for longer to try to you know, get the economy through this transition period. Because as you rightly point out, you are seeing significant increases in price uh, of insurance over there in t and in terms of goods as well as uh, you know the, uh, the devaluation does take an impact in terms of the producer prices and gate prices that you're seeing over there. So you're starting to see a bit of that come through in, this in terms of CPI as well. So the you know, purchasing power of people is, is also deteriorating. So it's going to be really mm -hmm. key, key data for the UK going forward um, this week. It's interesting. We had former Prime Minister Tony Blair out speaking over the weekend saying that uh, he is going to spend the bulk of his time trying to convince Britons that they can you know, change their mind essentially when it comes to Brexit, that the country still doesn't have to go down that path necessarily. I mean, if, if people, if average Britons start to see their prices rise, if they start to feel, feel some pain in their hip pocket, do you think there's any chance that, that the country could essentially change its mind, as Tony Blair seems to imply? My, my, my view is I, I still think it's very, very unlikely that the UK does leave the EU. I know Theresa May is still pushing for that March the 30th uh, deadline to trigger Article 50. But I still think that, you know, the average person in the UK, you know, woke up on that Friday morning after the vote with regret. They, it was a protest vote, the people I've been speaking to, it was a protest vote against immigration and the EU bureaucracy, and they didn't think that it was actually going to happen. If they were to hold the referendum again, I am pretty sure that you would get a different result and the, the whole issue would be taken away. However, the UK government has said that the UK people have voted and they are going to follow through on that and it, that means a hard Brexit. But you know, as you say, if more and more people see the economic uh, disadvantages of leaving and start to see pain where it counts in their take home pay, in their spending power, then I think more and more people will look to potentially change their view. I think it's actually quite fortunate that Tony Blair the ex-Labour leader and Prime Minister has taken this as his mission to try to um, change people's minds. It's kind of a, a kind of a get out of jail free for the Conservative Party uh, in terms of they can kind of, Tony Blair can fly the flag and, and see what happens in terms of that regard, yeah. in terms of how popular the, the, uh, this would be. But at the moment, the, you know, the UK government is still committed to triggering Article 50. It's an interesting one. A bit of buyer's regret perhaps will take hold. And I wonder... If you can draw a line between that, if you can draw a line between some of the disappointment that is happening around the globe when it comes to some of Donald Trump's more extreme, I suppose, in some ways, um, actions in the first uh, 20 days or whatever it is of his presidency, and the European elections that are coming up when it comes to the Netherlands, when it comes to France, that perhaps if we continue to see, I guess, um, some of the negative um, aspects of Trump coming through that it could actually sour some of that sentiment towards some of these more extreme parties in Europe. That, that's right, and, and you know, you, again, you're seeing political turmoil. You know, away from those elections that you mentioned, away from Greece and away from the Italian banks. Uh, you've seen over the weekend the uh, Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi's uh, resigned from his party, so they're going to have to have. Um, new elections there for his party. Um, he'll, he'll stand for re-election. That's probably likely to be in April, May. He couldn't get uh, the minority sections of his party to unite behind him. Uh, and then also in France as well, over the weekend, you had you know, 
kind of accusations flying about potential you know, funding misappropriation. Um, Marie Le Pen, the National Front, the far right candidate, you know, has become embroiled by saying that she had uh, friends working for the EU, um, friend, kind of jobs for friends, and she's denied that. It, you know, there was also talk that maybe the, the left um, would unite and that would form a credible threat to the polls. However, you know, given the conversations between the uh, socialist candidate and the far left candidate, that, that seems unlikely. So there's a lot of changing dynamics, but it's quite strange. But as you mentioned, there's a lot of political uncertainty, a lot of geopolitical uncertainty, but you are not seeing that manifest itself at all in the equity markets, which continue to kind of bounce up uh, to new record highs almost every day. And you're not seeing that in the volatility of, of, the, sh of the share market. You're seeing a bit of that caution come through again on Friday in government bond yields, the bonds 10-year uh, yield and also the 10-year U.S. Treasury did fall, which is kind of counterintuitive given you had a very strong uh, leading indicator um, read from the, um, from the U.S. and generally positive um, kind of U.S. data as well, which would typically send the, the yields higher. So I think there was a bit of caution coming across on the bond side of things, but in the equity markets, you know, it's kind of forget the geopolitical uncertainty, forget the uncertainty um, about Trump. And in fact, you know, he's, we're hoping that we'll get some further fiscal um, spending details from Trump this week or next, uh, because it's, it's, it's going to have to start to um, highlight those, else the market's going to start to lose faith that he's got any plans at all in that, in that space. Interesting times, Mark, and uh, we'll have to leave it there for now, but we'll talk uh, soon about how this is all manifesting itself in the global bond markets. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Nadine. Have a good one. Mark Bailey is